Caliban and the Witch, Section The Birth of the Cannibals When Columbus sailed to, quote, Indies, the witch hunt in Europe was not yet a mass phenomenon. Nevertheless, the use of devil worship as a weapon to strike at political enemies and vilify entire populations, like Muslims and Jews, was already common among the elite. More than that, as Seymour Phillips writes, a, quote, persecuting society had developed within medieval Europe, fed by militarism and Christian intolerance that looked at the other as mainly an object of aggression. Thus, it is not surprising if, quote, cannibal, infidel, barbarian, monstrous races, and devil worshipper were the, quote, ethnographic models with which the Europeans, quote, entered the new age of expansion providing the filter through which missionaries and conquistadors interpreted the cultures, religions, and sexual customs of the peoples they encountered. Footnote. Reporting about the island of Hispanola in his Historia General de las Indias, Francisco López de Gomara could declare with utter certainty that, quote, the main god which they have in this island is the devil, end quote, and that the devil lived among women, Similarly, Book 5 of Acosta's Historia, 1590, in which Acosta discusses the religion and customs of the inhabitants of Mexico and Peru, is dedicating to the many forms they have of devil worshipping, including human sacrifices. End of footnote. Other cultural marks contributed to the invention of the, quote, Indians. Most stigmatizing, and perhaps projecting the Spaniards' labor needs, were, quote, nakedness and sodomy that qualified the Amerindians as beings living in an animal state, thus capable of being turned into beasts of burden. Though some reports also stressed, as a sign of their bestiality, their propensity to share and, quote, give everything they have in return for things of little value, end quote. Defining the aboriginal American populations as cannibals, devil worshippers, and sodomites, supported the fiction that the conquest was not an unabashed quest for gold and silver, but was a converting mission, a claim that, in 1508, helped the Spanish crown gain for it the blessing of the Pope and complete authority over the Church in the Americas. It also removed, in the eyes of the world, and possibly of the colonizers themselves, any sanction against the atrocities which they would commit against the, quote, Indians, thus functioning as a license to kill, regardless of what the intended victims might do. And indeed, quote, the whip, gibbet, and stock, imprisonment, torture, rape, and occasional killing, became standard weapons for enforcing labor discipline in the New World. In a first phase, however, the image of the colonized as devil worshippers could coexist with a more positive, even idyllic one, picturing the, quote, Indians as innocent and generous beings, living a life, quote, free of toil and tyranny, recalling the mythical Golden Age, or an earthly paradise. This characterization may have been a literary stereotype, or, as Roberto Retamar, among others, has suggested, the rhetorical counterpart of the image of the, quote, savage, expressing the Europeans' inability to see the people they met as real human beings. Footnote. The, quote, carob slash cannibal image, Retamar writes, quote, contrasts with another one of the American man present in the writings of Columbus, that of Aruaco of the Greater Antilles, or Taino primarily, whom he describes as peaceful, meek, and even timorous, and cowardly. Both visions of the American aborigine will circulate vertiginously through Europe. The Taino will be transformed into the paradisical inhabitant of a utopic world. The carob, on the other hand, will become a cannibal, an anthropophagus, a bestial man, situated at the margin of civilization, who must be opposed to the very death. But there is less contradiction than might appear at first glance between the two visions. End quote. Each image corresponds to a colonial intervention, assuming its right to control the lives of the aboriginal population of the Caribbean, which Retamar sees as continuing into the present. Proof of the kinship between these two images, Retamar points out, is the fact that both the gentle Tainos and the ferocious Caribs were exterminated. End of footnote. But this optimistic view also corresponded to a period in the conquest 
from the 1520s to 40s, in which the Spaniards still believed that the aboriginal populations would be easily converted and subjugated. This was the time of mass baptisms, when much zeal was deployed in convincing the, quote, Indians to change their names and abandon their gods and sexual customs, especially polygamy and homosexuality. Bare-breasted women were forced to cover themselves. Men in loincloths had to put on trousers. But at this time, the struggle against the devil consisted mainly of bonfires of local, quote, idols, even though many political and religious leaders from central Mexico were put on trial and burned at the stake by the Franciscan father, Juan de Zumarraga, in the years between 1536, when the Inquisition was introduced in South America, and 1543. As the conquest proceeded, however, no space was left for any accommodations. Imposing one's power over other people is not possible without denigrating them to the point where the possibility of identification is precluded. Thus, despite the earlier homilies about the gentle Tainos, an ideological machine was set in motion, complementing the military one, that portrayed the colonized as, quote, filthy and demonic beings practicing all kinds of abominations while the same crimes that previously had been attributed to lack of religious education, sodomy, cannibalism, incest, cross-dressing, were now treated as signs that the, quote, Indians were under the dominion of the devil, and they could be justifiably deprived of their lands and their wives. In reference to this image shift, Fernando Cervantes writes in The Devil in the New World, quote, before 1530, it would have been difficult to predict which one of these views would emerge as the dominant one. By the middle of the 16th century, however, a negative demonic view of Amerindian cultures had triumphed, and its influence was seen to descend like a thick fog on every statement, officially and unofficially made on the subject. End quote. It could be surmised, on the basis of the contemporary histories of the, quote, Indies, such as De Gomara's and Acosta's, that this change of perspective was prompted by the Europeans' encounter with imperialistic states like the Aztec and Inca, whose repressive machinery included the practice of human sacrifices. In the Historia Natural y Moral de las Indias, published in Sevilla in 1590 by the Jesuit Joseph de Acosta, there are descriptions that give us a vivid sense of the repulsion generated among the Spaniards by the mass sacrifices carried out, particularly by the Aztecs, which involved thousands of youths, war captives, or purchased children, and slaves. Footnote. Human sacrifices occupy a large place in Acosta's account of the religious customs of the Incas and Aztecs. He describes how, during some festivities in Peru, even three or four hundred children, from two to four years old, were sacrificed. Duro en inhumano spectaculo, in his words. He also describes, among others, the sacrifice of 70 Spanish soldiers captured in battle in Mexico, and, like Dick O'Mara, he states with utter certainty that these killings were the work of the devil. End footnote. Yet, when we read Bartolome de la Casa's account of the destruction of the Indies, or any other account of the conquest, we wonder why should the Spaniards have been shocked by this practice? when they themselves had no qualms committing unspeakable atrocities for the sake of God and gold. And, according to Cortes, in 1521, they had slaughtered a hundred thousand people just to conquer Tenochtitlan. Similarly, the cannibalistic rituals they discovered in America, which figure prominently in the records of the conquest, must not have been too different from the medical practices that were popular in Europe at the time. In the 16th, 17th, and even 18th centuries, the drinking of human blood, especially the blood of those who had died of a violent death, and mummy water, obtained by soaking human flesh in various spirits, was a common cure for epilepsy and other illnesses in many European countries. Furthermore, this type of cannibalism, quote, involving human flesh, blood, heart, skull, bone marrow, and other body parts, was not limited to fringe groups of society, but was practiced in the most respectable circles. End quote. Footnote. In New England, medical practitioners administered remedies, quote, made from human corpses. Among the most popular 
universally recommended as a panacea for every problem, was, quote, mummy, a remedy prepared with the remains of a corpse dried or embalmed. As for the consumption of human blood, Gordon Gruber writes that, quote, it was the prerogative of executioners to sell the blood of decapitated criminals. It was given, still warm, to epileptics or other customers waiting in crowds at the spot of execution, cup in hand. End of footnote. Thus, the new horror that the Spaniards felt for the aboriginal populations after the 1550s cannot be easily attributed to a cultural shock, but must be seen as a response inherent to the logic of colonization that inevitably must dehumanize and fear those it wants to enslave. How successful was this strategy can be seen from the ease with which the Spaniards rationalized the high mortality rates caused by the epidemics that swept the region in the wake of the conquest, which they interpreted as God's punishment for the Indians' beastly conduct. Footnote. Walter L. Williams writes, quote, The Spanish did not realize why the Indians were wasting away from disease, but took it as an indication that it was part of God's plan to wipe out the infidels. Oviedo concluded, quote, It is not without cause that God permits them to be destroyed, and I have no doubts that for their sins, God's going to do away with them very soon. End quote. He further reasoned in a letter to the king condemning the Maya for accepting homosexual behavior, quote, I wish to mention it in order to declare more strongly the guilt for which God punishes the Indian, and the reason why they have not been granted his mercy. End of quote, and end of footnote. Also, the debate that took place in 1550 at Valladolid in Spain between Bartolomé de las Casas and the Spanish jurist Juan Guín de Sepulveda on whether or not the, quote, Indians were to be considered as human beings would have been unthinkable without an ideological campaign representing the latter as animals and demons. Footnote. The theoretical foundation of Sepulveda's argument in favor of the enslavement of the Indians was Aristotle's doctrine of, quote, natural slavery. End footnote. Picture. Travel logs illustrated with horrific images of cannibals stuffing themselves with human remains proliferated in Europe in the aftermath of the conquest. A cannibal banquet in Bahia, Brazil. According to the description of the German J.G. Aldenberg, End caption. The spread of illustrations portraying life in the New World that began to circulate in Europe after the 1550s completed this work of degradation, with their multitudes of naked bodies and cannibalistic banquets, reminiscent of which is Sabbats, featuring human heads and limbs as the main course. A late example of this genre of literature is Le Livre de Antipode, 1630, compiled by Johann Ludwig Gottfried which displays a number of horrific images, women and children stuffing themselves with human entrails, or the cannibal community gathered around a grill, feasting on legs and arms while watching the roasting of human remains. Prior contributions to the cultural production of the Amerindians as bestial beings are the illustrations in Les, Les Singularities de la France Antarctique, Paris 1557, by the French Franciscan André Thevet, already centered on the themes of the human quartering, cooking, and banquet, and Hans Staden's Varfartica Historia, in which the author describes his captivity among the cannibal indios of Brazil. Picture Cannibals in Bahia feasting on human remains Illustrations displaying the Amerindian community roasting and feeding on human remains completed the degradation of the aboriginal American populations begun by the work of the missionaries. End of caption and end of section. <laughs>